was the night before Christmas when all of the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in the hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled or snug in their beds, while the visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, to open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday objects below. When what to my wandering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer with a little old driver so lively and quick i knew in a moment it must be saint nick more rapid than eagles his coursers they came and he whistled and shouted and called them by name now dasher now dancer now prancer and vixen on comet on cupid on donna and blitzen to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky. So up to the house, top the courses they flew, with a sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof, the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face, the little round belly that shook with nothing, like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team, gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him explain, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night.
there. I didn't realize you were already here. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to one and all. I'm so glad you could make it. I'm going to kick off my boots and sit down. So throw a log on the fire, pour yourself some eggnog, and get ready for a very special delivery from your old pal, St. Nick. of angels themselves. There's nothing like some carols to make it feel like Christmas. That last one reminds me of a story. A story you might just be familiar with. It's about a little reindeer who's a little bit different. 
and boy does he have a hard time with it at first. So throw another log on the fire, for those of you without a fireplace, add a little rum to your eggnog, that'll warm you up just fine. <laughs> Gather around. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen. But do you recall the most famous reindeer of all? Come on, sing it with Santa! Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw him, you would even say it glows. All of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. And one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, That's me, Rudolph, with your nose so bright. Won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then all the reindeer loved him As they shouted out with glee Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer You'll go down in this story T'was the day before Christmas And all through the hills The reindeer were playing And enjoying the spills of skating and coasting and climbing the willows, and hopscotch and leapfrog, protected by pillows. <laughs> well, every so often they'd stop and call names at the one little reindeer not allowed in their games. Ha ha, look at Rudolph. His nose is a sight. It's red as a beet, twice as big, twice as bright. And Rudolph just cried. What else could he do? He knew that the things they were saying was true. Where most reindeer's noses were brownish and tiny, poor Rudolph's was red and large and quite shiny. In daylight it dazzled, at nighttime it glowed. Although he was lonesome, he always was good, obeying his parents as a good reindeer should. And that's why, on this day, Rudolph almost felt playful. Santa will be coming with his sleigh full of presents and candy and toys for good little animals and for good girls and boys. As night and a fog hid the world like a hood, he went to bed hopeful. He knew he'd been good. While way, way up north, on this same foggy night, old Santa was packing his sleigh for its flight. This fog, I said, will be hard to get through. I shook my head, and my tummy shook too. Ho, 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 ho. Without any stars or a moon as a compass, this extra dark night is likely to swamp us. We'll steer by the street lamps and houses tonight in order to finish before it gets light. Just think how the boys' and girls' faith would be shaken if we didn't reach them before they awaken. Come Dasher, come Dancer, come Prancer and Vixen, come Comet and Cupid, come Donner and Blitzen. Quick with your suppers, get hitched in a hurry, you too will find fog a delay and a worry. Old Santa was right, as he usually is. The fog was thick as a soda's white fizz. Just not getting lost required all of my skill, with street signs and numbers more difficult still. We tangled in treetops again and again, barely missing and hitting a tri-motor plane. We still made good speed, with much twisting and turning, as long as the street lamps and house lights were burning. At each house first noting the people who lived there, I quickly selected the presents to give there. By midnight, however, the last light had fled, 
for even big people have then gone to bed. Because it might wake them, a match was denied me. Oh, how I wished for just one star to guide me. Through dark streets and houses, old Santa fared poorly. I now picked the presents more slowly, less surely. I really was worried for what I would do if folks started waking before I was through. The air was still foggy, the night dark and drear, when I arrived at the home of the little reindeer. I tripped on a ledge while seeking the chimney. I went for a spill and skinned my right knee. The first reindeer bedroom was so very black, I tripped on the rug and fell on my back. So dark that I had to move close to the bed and squint very hard at the sleeping deer's head before I chose the right kind of toy. A doll for a girl or a train for a boy. But all of this took time and filled me with gloom as I fumbled towards the reindeer's next room. The next door I opened, when, to my surprise, a dim but quite definite light met my eyes. The light wasn't burning. The glow came instead from something that lay at the head of the bed. And there lay, but wait now, what would you suppose? The glowing you've guessed it, was Rudolph's red nose. His room was easy. This one little light let Santa pick quickly the gifts that were right. How happy I was till I went out the door. The rest of the house was as black as before, so black that it made every step a dark mystery. But then came the greatest idea in history. I went back to Rudolph and started to shake him, of course, very gently. And Rudolph could scarcely believe his own eyes. You can just imagine his joy and surprise at seeing who stood there so real and so near while telling a tale I've already told here. Poor Santa's sad tale of distress and delay, the fog and the darkness and losing the way. The horrible fear that some children might waken before my complete Christmas trip had been taken. And I told Rudolph he may yet save the day. Your wonderful nose may yet pave the way. For a wonderful triumph, it actually might. Old Santa, you notice, was extra polite, not making fun of Rudolph's red nose Christmas night. I need you, I said, to help me tonight, to lead all my dear on the rest of the flight. And Rudolph on to help Santa. such a big grin, Do it almost worry. connected his ears to his he chin. Wrote. A note for his folks, he dashed off in a hurry. I've gone to help Santa. He wrote. Do not worry. I said my sleigh I'll bring down to the lawn. You'll stick in the chimney, and in a flash I was gone. So Rudolph pranced out through the front door. His nose led the way to take his proud place at the head of the sleigh. The rest of the night? Well, what would you guess? Old Santa's idea was a brilliant success. And brilliant was almost no word for the way that Rudolph directed the deer and the sleigh. In spite of the fog, we flew quickly and low and made such use of the wonderful glow from Rudolph's nose at each intersection that not even once did we lose our direction. Old Santa knew always which children were good and minded their parents and ate what they should. Then I selected the gift that was right while Rudolph's red nose gave just enough light. It all went so fast that before it was day the very last present was given away. The very last stocking was filled to the top, just as the sun was preparing to pop. The sun woke the reindeer in Rudolph's hometown. They found the short message that he'd written down. They gathered outside to await his return, and weren't they excited and astonished to learn 
that Rudolph, the ugliest deer of all, Rudolph the red nose, so bashful and small, the funny-faced fellow they'd always called names and practically never allowed in their games, was now being envied by all far and near. For no greater honor can come to a deer than riding with Santa and guiding his sleigh, the number one job on the number one day. The sleigh and its reindeer soon came into their view, and Rudolph still led them as downward we flew. Oh boy, was he proud as they came to a landing. That's where his handsome playmates were standing. Those bad deer who used to do nothing but tease him would now have done anything only to please him. They felt even sorrier that they had been bad when I said, Rudolph, I have never had a deer quite so brave or brilliant as you at fighting black fog and guiding me through. By you last night's journey, was actually bossed. Without you, I'm certain we'd all have been lost. Well, Rudolph just blushed from his head to his toes until his whole fur was as red as his nose. The crowd first applauded, then started to screech, Hooray for Rudolph, and we want a speech. But Rudolph was bashful, despite being a hero, and tired as his sleep on the trip totaled zero, and that's why his speech was as brief as his nose was bright. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. So whenever a Christmas is foggy and gray, it's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer who guides my sleigh. Be listening this Christmas, don't make a peep, cause that late at night, children should be asleep. The very first sound that you'll hear on the roof will be sleigh bells ringing and Rudolph's small hoof. And soon after that, if you're still as a mouse, you may hear the swish as he flies round the house. And when we're all through, you may hear his voice as we drive out of sight. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Ho, 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 welcome back. I guess little Rudolph learned a lesson about being different. While it can be difficult at times, being different is what makes you special. And by the end, I think Rudolph was pretty thankful for that nose of his. I know I was. Oh, ho, 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 ho.
Christmas is a time to reflect on what we have and to be thankful. Sometimes it's easy to forget how much we have. And, well, why don't I tell you another story? This is a story of George Bailey, citizen of Bedford Falls, New York. George Bailey, who more than anything under the sun wanted to see the world, the wonderful, exciting world that lay somewhere beyond the limits of his hometown. Oddly enough, this story doesn't begin in Bedford Falls. In fact, it doesn't begin anywhere in the world. It begins in heaven, where the superintendent of angels has just summoned an apprentice angel named Clarence. Oh, I'm really going down to Earth, sir. Oh, how splendid. Yes, there's a very discouraged man down there, Clarence. George Bailey. At exactly 10.45 p.m., Earth time, he'll be thinking seriously of ending his life. Oh, dear, dear. His life! Now, I want you to stop him if you can. Now, sit down. Sit down. I'll give you Bailey's case history. Sir, if I should accomplish my mission, may I perhaps get my wings? I've been waiting over 200 years now, and, well, people are beginning to talk. Clarence, what's that book? The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, sir. I was reading it when you sent for me. Oh, fine book. Excellent. Well, you do a good job on George Bailey, and we'll see about your wings. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, now listen. When George Bailey was a boy, two events occurred that you should keep in mind. One was when his young brother Harry fell through the ice and almost drowned. George saved him. Mother fell through the ice. George saved him. Ever since, George has had a bad ear. All that icy water, you understand. Bad ear. Yes, sir. The other event came a few months later. George used to work after school in Mr. Gower's drugstore. One day, Mr. Gower's only son died of influenza. It was a terrible blow, and poor Mr. Gower tried to lose his grief in whiskey. Where have you been, George? Mrs. Blaine's called twice. What happened to her prescription? You lost it, didn't you? No, Mr. Gower, here it is. Oh, you good for nothing. Don't you know the Blaine girl's very M sick? Mr. Gower, my ear. You're hurting my sore ear. I'll teach Mr. you to Gower, lurk, you don't, lazy don't know what you're doing. You put something wrong in those capsules. I know you feel bad, but look, Mr. Gower. This bottle. You use this bottle to make up the capsules. It's poison. poison. Don't poison. hurt my sore ear again, Mr. Gower. Oh, George. It's why I didn't deliver it, Mr. Gower. All I wanted was to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Clarence, that was George Bailey as a boy. When he grew up, he wanted to go to college, but there wasn't the money. So he worked four years in the Building and Loan Association. Building and Loan Association. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you. George's father was in the building and loan business. He and George's Uncle Billy. High ideals and a low bank account. <laughs> anyway, George worked for his father and saved enough to see him through the university. That summer, though, he was going to Europe. Got a job on a cattle boat. Do a little traveling before college. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's hard to realize it's my last night at the Bailey boarding house. Oh, we're sure gonna miss you, George. Oh, I'm gonna miss you too, huh? Well, hey, what's the matter? You look tired. Oh, uh, I had another tussle with old Hazel Potter today. Oh, I thought when you put her on the board of directors, she'd ease up. Yeah, so did I. Well, I just can't understand a woman like Mrs. Potter. She can't begin to spend all the money she has. I guess Potter owns everything she wants in Bedford Falls, except our building and loan. That's why she hates hey, us. Hey, George, can I borrow your tuxedo studs? Yeah, help yourself, Harry. Well, where are they? In your suitcase? No, I'm not taking a tuxedo in a cattle boat, you know. Say, where'd you get that suitcase anyway? Oh, Mr. Gower. Going away present. One of these days, you're going to see that bag all covered with travel labels. Italy, Baghdad, Samarkand. Gonna have a pretty full summer, huh? I'm gonna have a pretty full life. Hey, why don't you come to the dance tonight? What, and be bored to death? Well, you couldn't want a better death. Lots of pretty girls. Hey, I gotta hurry. I wish we could send Harry to college with you. We've got that figured out now, Pop. He'll take my job at the building and loan, work four years like I did, 
and then he'll go. He's pretty young for that, John. Well, no younger than I was. Maybe you were born older, George. Huh? George, uh, when you get out of college, uh, I don't suppose you'd come back to the building and loan. Oh, no. Now, Pa, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't face being cooped up for the rest of my life in a shabby little office. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Pop. I didn't mean that, but it's just this business of nickels and dimes. I'd go crazy. I want to do something big, something important. Well, in a small way, we are doing something important, George. In that shabby little office, we help people figure out how they own their homes. I know, I know, Pop. I just wish I felt that I... But I just feel like if I didn't get away, I'd bust. Oh, you're right, boy. You get yourself an education. Then you get out of here. Pop, Pop, Pop. Do you want a shock? I think you're a pretty great guy. Well, thanks, George. I'm glad to hear it. Look, um, why don't you go over to Harry's dance? You'll have a good time. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll drop him. Maybe I will at that. So, George Bailey went to a dance. Is this important, Joseph? Why, it was the dance that he met Mary Hatch. Oh. And three hours later, he was walking her home. George and Mary were feeling pretty good, Clarence. As a matter of fact, wonderful. Buffalo gal, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gal, can't you come out tonight and dance by the light of the moon? Hot dog! Beautiful! Why, just like an orchid. At least. Gee whiz, you know something? If it wasn't me talking, I'd say you were the prettiest girl in town. Well, why don't you say it? I don't know. Maybe I will. How old are you, anyway? Eighteen. Eighteen? Too young or too old? Oh, no, just right. Sort of fits you. Hey, look where we are. Hmm? Oh, the old Granville house. Yeah. I gotta throw a rock. Oh, no, don't. I love that old house. Don't you know about deserted houses? You make a wish and then throw a rock. George, but it's such a lovely old place. I wish I lived there. In there? Well, I wouldn't live in it as a ghost. Now watch. Watch this. Here we go. How about it, huh? Pretty good shot, huh? Broke a window, huh? What do you wish, George? Oh, I don't know. Not just one wish. A whole hat full. Mary, I'm shaking the dust of this crummy town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum, and then I'm going back home to go to college and see what they know, and then I'm going to build things. I'm going to build airfields and skyscrapers a hundred stories high and bridges a mile long. And then I'm going to... Hey, Mary, what is it you want? What do you want, huh? Do you want the moon? All you got to do, just say the word and I'll... Okay, the moon. I'll take it. Then what? Then what? Well, well, then you could swallow it. And it would dissolve like aspirin, you know? And the moonbeams would shoot out of your fingers and the ends of your hair and and the uh You think I'm talking too much? Yes. Why don't you just kiss her instead of talking here to death? How's that? Uh, you're just wasting on the wrong people. Uh, hey, just a minute, mister. Uh, hey, you come on back here, and I'll show you some kissing that George. George! Well, hey, Uncle Billy! George. Look here, I'm gonna kiss Mary. What? Get in the car, quick. Your father's had a stroke. What? George, hurry. Well, George's father died that night, Clarence. So, of course, George couldn't go to Europe. But that fall, just as he was ready to leave for college, the directors of the building and loan had a meeting. They were going to appoint a successor to Mr. Bailey. A successor to our dear friend, Peter Bailey. What was that you said, Mrs. Potter? I said, as long as Peter Bailey's dead, let's dissolve the building and loan. We don't need it. Now, wait a minute. No, you wait a minute. Peter Bailey was not a businessman. Ideals without common sense can ruin a town. What do we get? A discontented, lazy rabble instead of a thrifty working class. Now, hold on, Mrs. Potter. I meant no disrespect, George, but- Now, wait a minute there. Why my father ever started this cheap, penny ante building and loan, I'll never know. But just remember this, Mrs. Potter. 
that this rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community. Well, is it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple decent rooms and a bath? Well, anyway, my father didn't think so. People were human beings to him. But to you, a warped, frustrated old bag, they're cattle. Well, in my book, they died a much richer person than you'll ever be. I'm not interested in your book. I'm talking about the building and loan. You're talking about something you can't get your fingers on and it's galling. That's what you're talking about. Well, this town needs this measly one-horse institution. If only to have some place where people can borrow dollars without crawling to you. Now, come on, Uncle Billy. What happened, George? All we heard was a lot of yelling. Boy, oh boy, you sure. Yeah, they're in there voting us out of business. Who cares? I can get another job. I'm only 41. 45. Will you get out of here, George? You missed your boat trip. You want to miss college, too? George, we just voted Potter down. We're still in business. Oh, me! Yippee! We're still in business. But there's one condition, George. Uh, they've appointed you to take your father's place. Appoint me? But I'm going to college. Look, this is my last chance. I I Uncle Billy, he's your man. George, you've got to take it. They'll vote with Potter otherwise. They said so. Uh, they even... I know. George Bailey didn't go to college. That's right, Clarence. He gave his college money to Harry. Harry went instead. Yes, but what happened to that good-looking girl? You know, Mary? Oh, George saw her now and then. Not very often, though, because Mary went away to school, too. Anyway, George waited four years more for Harry to come back and take over the building and loan. He could still see the world. He planned to work in the oil fields, Venezuela, except when Harry came home, he wasn't alone. There was a girl with him, his wife. George? Yeah, uh, I'm out here on the porch, Mother. Just thought I'd get some air. Well, how do you like your new sister-in-law? She's swell. Looks like she can keep Harry on his toes. Yeah, keep him out of Bedford Falls, anyway. What do you mean? Well, Ruth's father, he's got a wonderful job for Harry up in Buffalo. Buffalo? Yeah. Well, that means you... You can't... Yeah. George? Did you know Mary Hatch is back from school? Hmm. Yeah. Nice girl, Mary. Mm. Oh, stop grunting. Uh, Give me one good reason you shouldn't call on Mary. Well, Sam Wainwright. Sam's crazy about her. Well, she's not crazy about him. Well, now, how do you know that? Did she discuss it with you? How do you... Besides, Sam is away in New York. And all spare in love and war? Oh, all right, I see. Okay, Mother, I think I'll go out and find that girl and do a little passionate necking. Oh, George! Goodbye, Mrs. Bailey. Uh, by the way, do you want any books at the library? Library? George! George, you go and see Mary, do you hear? George? Is that you out there? Oh, uh, hello, Mary. Well, are you coming in? I just happened to be passing by. Oh, I thought you were picketing. Have you made up your mind? How's that? Have you made up your mind? About what? About coming in. Your mother just phoned. She said you were coming over. My mother just... I just happened to be passing by, that's all. Well... Well, all right. I'll come in for a minute. I didn't tell anybody I was coming over here. I thought I was go for a walk or so. When did you get back? Tuesday. Where did you get that dress? Do you like it? It's all right. Well, no point standing here on the porch. Come on in. Well, I still can't understand it. I didn't tell anybody I was coming here. Would you rather leave? Oh, I don't want to be rude. I'll sit down for a while. It's nice about your brother and Ruth, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Don't you like her? Well, of course I like her. She's a peach. Oh. It's just marriage in general you're not enthusiastic about, hmm? No, oh, marriage is all right for a lot of people. It's all right for Harry, Sam Wainwright, and you. For Sam- Mary! Uh, it's George Bailey, Mother. What's he want? I don't know. What 
do you want? Me? Not a thing. Not a thing. I just came in to get warm. He's making violent love to me, Mother. You just tell him to go right back home. Sam said he'll call you tonight from New York, didn't he? I guess so. How about some music? You know, your mother needed... You know, I didn't come here to... What did you come here for? I don't know. You're supposed to be the one that has all the answers. You tell me. Ugh, why don't you go home? You're, I don't know why I came here in the first place. Good night. Good night. Mary, the telephone. The way Mary. you're shouting, you think that... You think what? Mary! All right, I'll get it. George, on your way out, would you mind shutting off the phonograph? I'd be very happy to. Hold on, crazy song. Hello? Sam? How are you? I forgot my hat. Yeehaw. I was just talking to an old friend of yours, George Bailey. Yes, old Mossback George. Oh, wait a second, George? He doesn't want to speak to George. He does so. He asked for him. Did you call me? Because if you did, I'm in a hurry. Sam wants to talk to oh, you. Uh, I'm high at Sam. What do you mean? Nobody's trying to steal anybody's girl. Here, Mary, take the phone. He says to get on the extension upstairs. I can't. My mother's on the extension. I am not. We can both hear. Just put your head a little closer. There, that's better. We're listening, Sam. Soybeans? Yeah, yeah. Plastics? Yeah. Ugh. I'm here. Ugh. He says it's the chance of a lifetime. Now you give me that phone. Here's George again, Sam. George! Now you listen to me, Mary. I don't want any job, and I don't want to get married, ever, to anyone. Do you understand that? I want to do what I want to do, and you're not going to trick me, and you're... Mary! Mary! George! Oh, Mary, darling. I love you, Mary. Ooh. Well, well. So, George Bailey and Mary Hatch were... Yes, George and Mary were married. And they started off their honeymoon in Ernie Bishop's taxi cab. Hey, so where are you two going now on this new honeymoon? We're going to shoot the works, Ernie. A whole week in New York. A whole week in Bermuda. The highest hotel, the oldest champagne, the hottest music, and the prettiest wife. So, you're finally getting out of Bedford Falls, eh? Then what? Well, then what, honey? After that... Who cares? That does it. Hey, you know, Mrs. Bailey, I haven't kissed you yet. Hey, George, there's something funny going on over there. Look, look, over there at the bank. It looks like a run. All over there a minute, will you, Ernie? George, let's not stop. Please, let's go straight to the station. Now, wait a minute. You better George, see what it is. Please. I'll be right back. George! Poor George Bailey. Oh, he's certainly in desperate trouble, Joseph. I'll go help him at once. Now you sit down, Clarence, sit down. We're nowhere near the point where George Bailey is thinking of taking his life. We're not? Now, where were we? Oh, yes. George and Mary had just started out on their honeymoon when they ran smack into the financial panic of 1932. In the waiting room of the building and loan, a hundred frantic people were clamoring for their savings. Hey, what's going on, Uncle Billy? What's happened? All those people out there. This is a pickle, George. All I know is the bank called our loan an hour ago. They had to hand over all our cash. Holy mackerel. The whole town's gone crazy. The bank's in the same spot we are. Our charter, too? And what about our charter? Our charter says we have to stay open till 6 p.m. The state can take away our license if we don't. How can we stay open until 6 without any money? George, where are you going? Out to talk to those people. Come on. Where's our money? I gotta put food in my face. I gotta put food in my face. Now listen, folks. Just a minute, please. How about our money, George? Where's our money? Wait a minute now. Listen to me. Now, you're thinking of this place all wrong. Your money's not here. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Your money's in people's houses. In the Kennedy house. And the McLaren house, and your house, and a hundred others. Now, what are you going to do? Foreclose on them? I have $240 in shares. Now let me have. All right, all, all right. You'll get your money in 60 days. 60 days? That's way too long. Now look. 
That's what you agreed on when you bought your shares. Let's take our shares to pot. Yeah. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. get out of here. I like him better. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Please, folks. I beg of you not to do this. If Potter gets hold of your shares, she'll be owning this building in loan. She's got the bank, she's got the bus line, she's got the department stores, and now she's after us because she wants to keep you living in her shacks and paying the kind of rent she decides to charge. Now, we can get through this thing, all right? We've got to stick together. We've got to have faith in each hey, other. My husband's out of work. We need yeah, money. Yeah, I've got doctor's bills to pay. I can't feed I my kids on the phone. Oh, God. God. I want to pay for everyone. I can't do it. How much do you need? We've still got some money. Hey, Mary. Here it is, George. You told me to hold on to it. Would have made a nice honeymoon. Bought furniture, too. Wait a minute, folks. Listen, I got $2,000, all right? Tom, how much do you need? $240. Now, Tom, just enough to tide you over. I said $240. Okay, okay. Uncle Billy, give Tom $240. All right. Ed, how much just to get by? Uh, $20, I suppose. Now you're talking. Mrs. Thompson, how about you? $20 will do me. Good. $20. Uncle Billy, pay it back when you can now. All right. All right. Who's next? Look at the clock. Look! Five uh, seconds. Four, four seconds. Three, three two, two, one! Walk the Walk that door, you get quick! Boy, we're still in business, Uncle Billy. We even got two bucks left. George, there's a call for you. Okay, and then call my wife, will you? She's probably over at Mother's. Mrs. Bailey's on the line. I don't want Mrs. Bailey. I want my wife. Mrs. Bailey. That's my wife. Hey, give me the phone, will you? Hey, Mary. Listen, I'm sorry. Come home? What home? 323 Sycamore? Well, whose home is that? Well, Mary, how can I... Sure, I'll be there. Clarence, guess what 323 Sycamore was? His mother-in-law's, huh? Oh, no. Number 323 Sycamore was the old Granville house. The one George threw rocks at and made wishes. Yes, sir, that's where they spent their honeymoon. That's where they started housekeeping. They were still living there two years later when old Lady Potter asked George to stop over at his office. Sit down, George. Sit down. Have a cigar. Thank you, ma'am. Now, George, you're a young man. Married, making, say, $40 a week at the building and loan. Forty-five. Forty-five. Now, if you were an ordinary yokel, I'd say you were doing fine. But George Bailey is intelligent, ambitious. He hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. He's been dying to get out of town ever since he was born, but he's trapped. Trapped into frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to a lot of blue-collar lowlifes. Do I paint a correct picture, George, or do I exaggerate? Well, what's your point, Mrs. Potter? My point is that you're the only man in town who's licked me. George, I want to hire you. Manage my affairs. I'll start you off at twenty thousand dollars. Twenty thousand dollars a year? Are you sure you're talking to me? I'm George Bailey. Don't you remember me? The building and loan, remember? Yes, George Bailey, whose ship has just come in, providing he has brains enough to climb aboard. Well, what about the building and loan? Confound it, man. I'm offering you a three-year contract at $20,000 a year. Is it a deal or isn't it? No. No. The answer's no, doggone it. If you offered me a million dollars to stay around this town and, and play stooge to you, the answer'd still be no. Now let me alone. Don't bother. George, what did Mrs. Potter want? Oh, it was nothing. It, she just wanted to talk. Talk. Oh, gee. Mary Hatch. Why? Why in the world did you marry a guy like me anyway? To keep from being an old maid? I was going to see the world. 
I was going to build things. I was going to give you the moon. What have I given you? What have I given you? Not even a new dress. Not for months. Gee whiz, I feel awful. So do I. Mornings especially. You could have married Sam Wainwright or anybody else in town. I didn't want to marry anybody else in town. I want my baby to you look didn't like even you. Have a honeymoon, and I promise you that. You, you, you're what? My baby. You mean. Mary, you mean you're on the nest? <laughs> well, Mary had her baby, Clarence. A boy. You don't say. Then she had another one. A girl. Well, what do you know? Night after night, George had come home late from the office. Things weren't good with the building and loan. Potter was really bearing down on him. Then came the war. Mary had another baby by then. Oh. But she still had time to help out in the USO. Uncle Billy sold war bonds. And George's brother Harry became a real war hero. Shot down 15 planes. But George, what about George? George was 4F on account of his ear. He was an air raid warden. On VE day, he wept and prayed. On VJ day, he wept and prayed again. We're, uh, we're getting pretty close to today, aren't we, sir? Yes, Clarence. You now know almost everything you have to know about George Bailey. Except what happened that finds him down there at this moment, wanting to die. Well, sir? Well? Today's the day before Christmas, er, Earth time. George is pretty excited. Hey, Tilly! Eustace! Look at the newspaper! Commander Harry Bailey, decorated by the President! That's my kid brother, the Congressional Medal of Honor! Boss, George! Boss! What do you think about that? Fifteen enemy fighters, and the last one he got was just about to dive into a transport loaded with soldiers. You know what that means? He saved lives. Hundreds of lives. Gee whiz. Where's Uncle Billy? Gone to the bank, George. He's depositing that $8,000. Good, good. Who's that in his office there? It's that man again, the bank examiner. Oh, oh. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Carter. Hey, Tilly, get the books for Mr. Carter, will you? You know, that's my brother's picture there, Mr. Carter. He shot down 15 planes. One of them... Well, 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 Mrs. Hazel F. Potter. Come to the bank to deposit some more loot, eh? Out of my way, you old fool. How'd you like the news in the paper, Mrs. Potter? Just can't keep those baby boys down now. Let so. me see that. <laughs> Here, sorry I can't chat, you old thief. Gotta make a deposit. <sighs> Here you are, Henrietta. Slip, book, and a very Merry Christmas to you. You too, Mr. Bailey. Say, you've forgotten something, haven't you? Henrietta, I've forgotten things all my Get a wheel on, boy. But Mr. Bailey, where's the money? What's that? You want to make a deposit? Certainly I want Well, to. it's customary to bring the money with you. It's gone? Where'd I put it? Where'd I put that money? A terrible thing, Clarence, terrible. Uncle Billy couldn't find the money because the envelope with $8,000 was folded up in that newspaper he gave to old Lady Potter. I just don't know what happened to it, George. I just don't know. $8,000, Uncle Billy. The bank examiner's here, and it's not our money. It belongs to the depositor. George, what are we going to do? We faced every step I took. We can't stand in the streets. Are you sure you didn't put the envelope in your pocket? I think so. Maybe. Maybe... I'm no good to you, George. I'm now no listen good. to me. Think. Think, will you? Now try and think. I, I can't anymore, George. I can't think anymore. Where's anymore. that money, you silly old fool? You know what this means? It means bankruptcy and, and scandal and prison. One of us is going to jail. Well, it's not going to be me. Now get out of my way. I'm going home. George, dear, what's wrong? You haven't said a word since you came home. With that banging on the piano, does she have to keep playing the same song over and over and over again? But I have to practice for the Christmas party, Daddy. What is it, dear? A another hectic day? Yeah, yeah, another red letter day for the Bailey. Dad, the Murphy's got a brand new car. You should see it. What's the matter with our car? Isn't it good enough for you? I'm sorry, Dad. I only well, run upstairs, Petey, and see if Zuzu's all right. Okay, Mom. Now, what do you mean? 
be if Zuzu's all right. What do you mean? Oh, she caught a little cold coming home from school. She didn't button up her coat. Oh, what is it? What do you mean, just a cold? George, the doctor says it was nothing serious. A doctor? Was there a doctor here? Well, I thought he better look at her. It's the strap, the old house. It's no wonder we don't all have pneumonia. It might as well be living in a refrigerator. Why did we have to live here in the first place and stay around this measly, crummy old town? George, what's happened? Everything's happened. You call this a happy family? Why did we have to have all these kids? Daddy, how do you spell frankincense? I don't know how to spell it. Ask your mother. Where are you going? Upstairs to see Zuzu. Hello? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Welch. I'm sure she'll be all right. Who's that? Zuzu's school teacher. What? Oh, yes. The doctor says she'll be fine tomorrow. Here, give me that phone. Uh, George, please. Mrs. Welch, this is Mr. Bailey. Say, what kind of teacher are you, anyway? What do you mean sending Zuzu home like that, half naked? Do you realize she'll probably end up with pneumonia because of your stupidity? You know, maybe my kids aren't the best dressed kids in town, but at least... Hello? Hello? <laughs> Janie, will you stop playing that lousy piano? Now cut it out, stop George, it! George, for heaven's <laughs> sake, what's wrong with you? I'm sorry, Mary. <laughs> Janie, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I've just got to get out of here. So that's it, George. You're short $8,000 in your accounts, eh? Please, Mrs. Potter. I'll pay any sort of a bonus if you still want the building and loan. Why, I... You say it was lost. Have you notified the police? No, ma'am. I haven't done that yet. Harry's home coming tomorrow. Why come to me? What about your good friend Sam Wainwright? I can't get a hold of him. He's in Europe. What kind of security would I have, George? What collateral? Yes, ma'am. I have some life insurance here. A $15,000 policy. Hmm. What's your equity in it? Five hundred dollars. And you want eight thousand? You once called me a warped, frustrated old bag. Well, what are you but a warped, frustrated young man? Crawling on your hands and knees for help. Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so well? Ask them for help. I'll do anything, Mrs. Potter. Please. Please help me. My wife and kids. I'm calling the district attorney. Five hundred dollars. You know something, George? You're worth more dead than you are alive. Now get out of here. Get out! In all that time, Potter had the eight thousand dollars in her desk drawer. It's still there, Clarence. But where is George, sir? Where? Well, he went over to Martini's bar. He's had a couple of drinks, Clarence. He's just standing there, sort of in a daze. Oh, God. God. Dear Father in Heaven. I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, God. Bailey, you are right. Don't drink any more Please. You don't feel good. Bailey? You say Bailey? Which Bailey? This gentleman is Mr. Bailey. George Bailey. George Bailey, huh? <laughs> And the next time you talk to my wife like that, you'll get worse. It isn't enough she's slaves teaching your stupid kids how to read and write. You gotta ball her out. You get out of here, Mr. Welch. You hit my best friend. Get out! All right, I'm going. Mr. Bailey, you okay? Who was that? Oh, Mr. Welch, but don't worry. You don't come in this place. No more. I get something for your faces, please. No, I'm all right. Please don't go, Senior Bailey. Leave me alone. Oh, no, please don't go this way, Senior Bailey. Leave me alone. Bailey. George left Martini's Cafe five minutes ago, Clarence. He's at the river now, on the bridge, looking at the water. Are you ready, Clarence? All ready, sir. Very well. Save George Bailey's life, and you'll get your wings. My wings? Oh, thank you, Joseph. George? George Bailey? Get away from that bridge! Do you hear me? George! George! <laughs> Oh, <laughs> oh,
Oh, help! Help, I'm drowning! Oh, help! Oh, help! Oh, oh, oh. You're sure you're all right? You want a doctor? Oh, I'm all right. You? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, this underwear. I didn't have time to get anything more stylish. My wife gave this to me on my last birthday. I passed away in it. You what? Oh, I see Tom Sawyer's drying out, too. Who? My book. I looked in such a hurry, I brought Tom Sawyer with How me. How did you happen to fall? Oh, I jumped in. I jumped in to save you. Jumped in to save me? Well, I... I, I did, didn't I? <sighs> you didn't go through with it, did you? Go through with what? Um, suicide. Where did you come from? Heaven. Oh, that's... <laughs> That's very funny. Very funny. <laughs> your, your lip's bleeding. Uh, yeah. I got a bus in the jaw in answer to a prayer. Oh, no, George. I'm the answer to your prayer. How do you know my name? Oh, I know all about you. Who are you supposed to be, anyway? Clarence Oddbody, AS2. Oddbody, AS2. What's that AS2 for? Angel, second class. Hey, look here. Why would you want to save me? Because I'm your guardian angel, George. I see. Uh-huh. Well, you look like about the kind of angel I'd get. What happened to your wings? Oh, I haven't won my wings yet. That's why I am an angel second class. Oh, I see. But you can help me earn them, George, by letting me help you. Oh, uh-huh. You don't happen to have 8,000 bucks on you, do you? Oh, no, no. We don't use money in heaven. Oh, that's right, yeah. I keep forgetting. Comes in pretty handy down here, oh, Bob. Well, of course, I found it out a little late. You know, I'm worth more dead than alive. You mustn't talk like that. Joseph will never give me my wings if you keep feeling that way. You, you just don't realize what you've done for your folks. Why, if it hadn't been for you... Yeah, if it hadn't been for me, everybody'd be better off. My wife and my kids and my friends. Oh, this is not going to be easy. They'd all have been better off if I hadn't been born. What did you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. George, that's wonderful. Wonderful what? The idea you just gave me. You got your wish. You've never been born. I've never been born. Exactly. No worries. No $8,000 to get. Nothing. You simply don't exist. All right. All right. Okay. All right. George, I can do things. Strange things. I can show you the world, George, the way it would be if you hadn't been born. Hey, hey, wait a minute. This air of mine, say something else in that bad ear. You don't have a bad ear anymore. Oh, I don't think you're concentrating. Don't you see? You're not the George Bailey you think you are. You're, well, you're nobody. That's the doggonest thing, that ear. Your lips stop bleeding too, George. Yeah, yeah. Say, what's happening around here? What is this, anyway? I need a drink. That's what I need. What about you, Angel? You want a drink? Well, I don't quite know. Come on, come on. We'll go as soon as our clothes are dry. Our clothes are dry, George. Hey, so they are. That's funny. Well, look, let's get dressed and we'll stroll over to Martini's and then... Oh, excuse me. I mean, I'll stroll. You fly. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have my wings. You don't have your wings yet. That's right. I forgot that again. Couple of drinks and we'll both fly. What'll you have, fellas? Hey, where's the boss? Where's Martini? Look, wise guy. I'm the boss, see? Okay. Well, double scotch. Quick, will ya? What's yours? I would just love some mulled wine. Huh? Heavy on the cinnamon and light on the cloves. Off with you, my la my ma'am, and lively now. Now cut it out. Oh, come on here. Just give him the same as my order. He's okay. Mm. Two double scotches. What about this place? It's all changed. All of Bedford Falls has changed. You're having your wish, George. You've never been born. Oh, there'll be lots of things you've never seen before. Oh, good. Somebody just made it. Made what? Every time a bell rings, that means an angel's got his wings. What did you say? Uh, look, Clarence, I don't think you'd better talk about angels around here. They don't believe in angels? Oh, yeah, they believe in them, but 
You know, it's just... Uh, then why should they be surprised when they see one? Don't mind him, bartender. He's just a little fella that never grew up. How old are you anyway, Clarence? Oh, well, next May, I'll be 293. That does it. Go get, you hear me? Get! Well, where's Martini? Will you call Stop him? Stop asking about Martini. He ain't here and he... Hey, you! Rummy! Didn't I tell you never to come panhandling around here? George, look. Hey, it's Mr. Gower. Mr. Gower. Listen, Mr. Gower, don't you know me? This is George Bailey. You, uh, you buy me a drink, mister? Just one drink, will you, mister? Hey, out, you rummy, out. Oh, no, no, please. Hey, bartender, that, that's Mr. Gower, the druggist. That rumhead spent 20 years in jail for poisoning some kid. If you know him, you must be a jailbird yourself. Get out of here! Come on, George. Where's Mr. Gower? Mr. Gower doesn't know you, George. You see, you weren't there to stop him from putting poison into that prescription. What do you mean I wasn't there? Look, tell me, what are you, a hypnotist? George. Why am I seeing all these strange things? Don't you understand? It's because you were not born. Then if I wasn't born, who am I? Nobody. You have no identity. What do you mean, no identity? No papers, no cards, no driver's license, no 4F card, no insurance policy. Zuzu's bill. What? Zuzu's bill. I bought my little girl a bell to hang on the Christmas tree, and I forgot to give it to her, and I got it in my... It's gone. It, it's gone, too. Everything is gone. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like if you had never been born. You're crazy. You're crazy as a bed bug, and you're driving me crazy, too. Now, look, I'm going home to my wife and family. Do you understand that? And I'm going home alone. Better not leave him alone, Clarence. I keep following. Joseph! Oh, I'll stay near him, sir. Poor George. He's seeing Main Street now, the way it would be if he hadn't lived. The thing that's really shocked him, sir, is... Well, the building and loan office. You know what's there now? A pawn shop. What's he doing? Can you see? He's talking to Ernie Bishop, the taxi driver. He wants to go home. Better tag along, Clarence. Oh, I will, sir. I will. Come on, step on it, Ernie. Get me home. I'm off my nut. Hey, where do you live, buddy? Oh, doggone it, Ernie. Don't you start pulling that stuff on me. 323 Sycamore. 323 Sycamore? Yeah, yeah. Hurry up. Zuzu's sick. Okay, buddy. Hey, look, Ernie, I don't know what's happening. I'm going crazy or something. I've got some bad liquor. Now, look, tell me this now. You're Ernie Bishop, right? And you live with your wife and kid down you in... you seen my wife? In your wife. I've been to your house a hundred times. We built it for you, didn't we? Look, bud, my wife took the kid and ran away five years ago, okay? I ain't seen you before in my life, see? Okay, Ernie, okay, just step on it. Get me home. Mary? Mary, where are you? JD? Petey? Zuzu? Zuzu, where are you? This is just an old abandoned house, George. You have no wife, no children. Where are they? What have you done with them? There you are, bud. Crazy, just like I told you, huh? All right, up with your hands. Oh, Bert. Bert the cop, thank heaven you're here. Now look, why don't you be a good fella, and I'll take you to a doctor. Bert. Now, Bert, listen to me. What's the matter with you guys? Now, now listen. It's that fellow there. He, he says he's an angel. He tried to hypnotize me. I hate to use my nightstick, but I guess... Ow! Run, George, run! He can't hit you when I'm biting him! Ow! George, run! My teeth aren't what they used to be! Joseph, help! Joseph! Joseph! Where'd they go, honey? Where'd they go? Hey, I don't know. They just disappeared. Clarence! Oh, Joseph, I hope you don't mind my calling on you like I did. It was very irregular, Clarence. You're by yourself again. Where's George? He's at his mother's house, sir. Well, if George hasn't been born, he has no mother. Oh, he's being very stubborn, sir. He'll just have to find these things out for himself. But his mother? That's a terribly bitter blow to a man, his own mother not knowing him. You mean I shouldn't have let I him... mean you'd better find him right away. Oh, and stop biting policemen, Clarence. I'm here again, George. My mother. My own mother didn't even know me. 
If only Harry were here. If my brother were only back from Washington. Your brother fell through the ice and was drowned at the age of That's nine. That's a lie. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Don't you see, George? You've really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Clarence? Yes? Where's Mary? Please, where's my wife? I... I'm not supposed to tell. Tell me where she is. You're not going to like it. Where too. is she? I'll choke it out of you if I have to. Where's my wife? The, the library! She works there. She's just about to lock up for the night. So I, uh... George! George, come back! Oh, there has to be some easier way for me to get my wings! Mary! Mary! I'm sorry, the library is closed. Mary, it's George. Don't you know me? No, I don't know you. Mary, please. Let me go! Don't do this to me. Please, Mary, help get me. Get away from me! Where's our kid? Help! I need you, Mary. Help! Help me, Mary. Mary, I'm George. <laughs> help me, Clarence. Get me back. I don't care what happens to me. Only get me back to my wife and kids, please. I want to live again. Oh, thank you, George. Thank you, Lord. I want to live again, please. Oh, God, please. Let me live again. George? Is that you down there, George? Now get out of here, Bert. Get out of here. You'll get any closer and I'll let you have what it. What in the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? Come on, George. George. Bert. Do you know me? Know you? <laughs> I've been looking all over town for you. Where you been? Bert. Bert. I'm alive again, Bert. I'm sure you're all right? Hey, your mouth's bleeding. It is? Hey! My mouth's bleeding, Bert! Look at that blood coming out of there, would you? Susu's Christmas mail. Bert, I had it in my pocket. Here it is! Hey, it's in my pocket. What do you know about that? Hey, Merry Christmas, Bert. Well, Merry Christmas. Uh, get in the car. I'll, I'll, I'll drive you home. Will you, Bert? Well, do that and turn the sirens wide open, huh? Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls. Merry Christmas, old building at home. Merry Christmas, Mrs. Potter. Yippee! Come on, and, hey, Bert, and come on in with me, huh? What's with all these people? These reporters? Well, Merry Christmas, reporters. Hey, Mr. Bank Examiner, Merry Christmas. Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000, I'll bet, huh? George, I, I got a little paper here. I didn't have the heart to give it to you earlier. I, I'm sorry. I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't that wonderful? Merry Christmas! I, where's Mary? You know, oh, look at this wonderful old crafty house. Isn't it what? Have you seen my wife? Where's Mary? Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas Daddy. Daddy. Daddy! Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas Daddy. Kids, hey, kids! Pete? Janie? Oh, I could eat you all up. Where's your mother? She went looking for you, Daddy, with Uncle Billy. Daddy! Zuzu! Zuzu, my little ginger snap, how do you feel? Fine, Daddy. Not a smidge of temperature. Not a smidge of temperature. Hallelujah! George, darling. Mary! Mary! George, darling, where have you been? Oh, George, George, George! Mary, just let me touch you. Oh. You're real. Oh, you have no idea what's happened to me. You have no idea what's happened either. They're on their way here. Oh, who's on their way? Oh, the police department? The FBI? The National Guard? Well, I'm alive again, Mary. Oh, listen, Mary, I'm alive again. Oh, yes, darling. Yes. Now, close your eyes and come on downstairs. What is it? Can I open my eyes yet? Mary, what's going on Now here? keep your eyes closed. I'll just walk you over here by the Christmas tree. There's people. I hear lots of people. What is it? Just one minute now. We're all ready, Uncle Billy. Come in, everybody. Hey! 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 
George, look, just look. Oh, Billy? Money, George. A laundry basket filled with money. Money for you. Mary did it, George. Mary! I don't understand. What money? People heard you were in trouble, darling. These people, your friends, they've collected this money for you. The $8,000. Well, wait. There's Martini and Mr. Gower. Hey, how are you, Mr. Gower? Mrs. Thompson and Tom, everybody. None of us would have had a roof over our heads if it wasn't for you. Absolutely. You did it. All right, lots of Marsh, this is wonderful. Hey, Mary, look. Look who's coming in. Mother. Hi, Mother. Hey, and Harry. I got Mary's telegraph, George. I flew in as fast as I could. Hey, everybody, hey. A toast. How about a toast? Good huh? idea, Ernie. A toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Yeehaw! Yay! Daddy, my Christmas bell. You didn't forget. Forget? Here, honey. Here's your bell. Darling, what's this on the table here? What's this book? The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. <laughs> well, look, there's something written in it. Dear George, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wings. Love, Clarence. Clarence? Yep, he's a very dear friend of mine. Daddy, Mrs. Welsh said, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That's right, Zuzu. That's right. That's right. Out of boy, Clarence. Out of boy, Clarence. Happy landings. It is a wonderful life, as long as we can have such fine performances as we enjoy tonight. I'd like to thank whatever guardian angel brought all of you to the show this evening. I think maybe it's time I made a few Zoom calls to the people who have made my life brighter. Now, how does this confounded thing work? Mrs. Claus? Uh, how do I get this to work? Well, oh, 
snowflakes. Oh. I, I don't know what's wrong with a good old-fashioned telephone call. All you had to do was what? Oh, what's this now? Martha! I, I, I can see them, but I can't see myself. Uh, can they hear me? I already tried that. It didn't work. Oh, never mind. <laughs> it's working now. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot you were still here. Let me put on some more music while you wait. Santa's back from his Zoom calls. It's not quite the same as actually being together, but I'm learning. Santa has to keep up with the times, you know. 
Why, it feels like only yesterday that all we made here at the North Pole was wooden trains and woolen dollies. But kids are too much grown up for things like that now. <laughs> all they ask for is PlayStations and iPhones and, oh, what's that latest thing? Animatronic Baby Yodas. <laughs> it's true. It's a lot of work. But it's easy when you know exactly what everyone wants. Giving gifts isn't so easy for everybody, though. Our next story is about two struggling young kids in love and the lengths they go to show it as Christmas Day approaches. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry $1.87 that was all, and 60 cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and 87 cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl. So Della did, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly bag a description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the mendicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letterbox, into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with a powder rack. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day and she had only one dollar and 87 cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim, her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an $8 flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within 20 seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty bride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out of the window to dry it just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him plug at his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. 
And then she did it up again, nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket. On went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with a brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sophronie, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up Della ran and collected herself panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the Sophronie. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours trip by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way a little to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within 40 minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself, Before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and 87 cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stairway, down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit for saying little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty. The door opened and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow. He was only 22, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and bent for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say, Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair? asked Jim, laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact, yet even after the hardest mental labor. Cut it off and sold it, said Della. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, ain't I? 
Jim looked about the room curiously. You say your hair is gone? He said with an air almost of idiocy. You needn't look for it," said Della. "It's sold. I tell you, sold and gone too. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered." She went on with sudden serious sweetness. "But nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim?" Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week or a million a year? What is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. The stark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket. And threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell," he said. "I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. White fingers and nimble toward the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas. A quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the Lord of the Flat, for there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew. And her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now, they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, "My hair grows so fast, Jim." And then Della leaped up like a little singed cat and cried. Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me a watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying. Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. "Dal," said he, "let's put our Christmas presents away and keep 'em a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men." Wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasure of the house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest, everywhere they are wisest. They are the magi. I wish I could have stepped in to help those crazy kids, Jim and Della, but they were in the middle of learning the true meaning of Christmas, and sometimes you just have to let fate take its course. You know, 
It really is the most wonderful time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. With the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you the have good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the happiest season of all.
chair for that last lot, I'd better sit down and catch my breath. Mrs. Claus would kill me if she saw, I don't mind telling you, my weight. All those cookies have caused my heart to swell several times a healthy size. Hmm, that reminds me of a certain someone. Hmm, I can smell that turkey and stuffing coming along. Boy, my mouth is watering. Delivering all those toys is hungry work. How about another story while we wait? Maybe another drink. Ah. Oh, ho, ho, ho. oh, well. Here's a story about one lonely old soul who was just green with envy and the deliciously evil scheme he concocted to take Christmas away from everyone. I think by now you might know who I'm talking about. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be perhaps that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown 
at the warm lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming. I must find some way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow he knew all the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise. Oh, the noise. Noise, noise, noise. noise. That's one thing he hated. The noise, 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 noise. noise. Then the Who's young and old would sit down to a feast. And they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast. feast. Feast, feast, feast. They would feast on Who pudding and rare Who roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then... They'd do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the who's would start singing. And they'd sing, 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 sing. sing, sing. sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for fifty-three years I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do. The Grinch laughed in his throat. And he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked. What a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I'll look just like St. Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But since reindeer are scarce, there was none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? (laughs) No, the Grinch simply said. If I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max. Then he took some red thread. And he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh, and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, Get up! And the sleigh started down toward the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Cuddly as a cactus, you're as charming as an eel, Mr. Grinch. You're a bad banana with a greasy black peel. All their windows were dark, quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming sweet dreams without care when he came to the first little house in the square. This is stop number one. The old Grinchy Claws hissed, and he climbed on the roof, empty bags in his fist. Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once, for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue, where the little who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room and took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn and plums. And he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Monster, Mr. Grinch, your heart's an empty hole. Your brain is full of spiders, you've got garlic in your soul, Mr. Grinch. I wouldn't touch you with a burning half foot pole. 
Then he slunk to the icebox. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that icebox as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of Who hash. Then he stuffed all the food up the chimney with glee. And now, grinned the Grinch, I will stuff up the tree. And the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to shove when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast and he saw a small who. Little Cindy Lou Who, who was no more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick, he thought up a lie, and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake Santa Claus lied, there's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there, then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head, and he got her a drink, and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for the fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire, and the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. You're a vile one, Mr. Grinch. You have turns in your smile. You have all the tender sweetness of a seasick crocodile. Mr. Grinch. Given the choice between the two of you, I'd take the seasick crocodile. A dead tomato blushed with moldy purple spots. You're a three decker sour crumb toast to a sandwich with arsenic sauce. You nauseate, Mr. Grinch, with a nausea. No, no. You're a crooked turkey jacket and you drive a crooked horse, Mr. Grinch. All is an appalling dump, overflowing with the most disgraceful assortment of rubbish imaginable, mangled up in tangled up knots. You're a foul stupid bitch. You're a now. Full of unwatched socks, and a soul is full of gun. Grinch. The three words that best describe you are as follows, and I quote: stink, stank, stunk. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still abed, all the who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled. Packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. Three thousand feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip-top to dump it. Poo-poo to the Who's. He was grinchishly humming. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open for a moment or two, 
then the Who's down in Whoville will all cry. Boo-hoo! <laughs> that is a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why? The sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so. But it was merry. Very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light, and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. I'm glad to see the Grinch learned to put his devilish imagination to good use, spreading joy instead of misery. And how about that sleigh ride down the mountain with all the toys? Ho, 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 ho! That's my favorite part! Living here at the North Pole, I always get a white Christmas, and this year's no exception. All the elves keep telling me about climate change and global warming and, uh, carbon footprints? They even made sure the toy factory uses only locally sourced and sustainably farmed materials. Those little guys never cease to amaze me. They've gotten awfully pushy and expensive since they unionized, but hey, it's important to Santa to set a positive example with regard to workplace standards in this day and age. I bet you didn't even know I paid those elves, did you? What was I talking about? Oh yes, snow!
really can't stay. Maybe it's cold outside. I gotta go away. Maybe it's cold outside. This evening has made. I'm hoping that you drop so in. So very nice. And just like my this. mother will start to worry. My father will be pacing the floor. So really, I'd better scurry. Well, I hope you're really in the Christmas spirit now, because next we have a story about another mean old Grinch whose Christmas spirit is found severely lacking. And speaking of spirits, a few are about to pay him a visit.
Marley's ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend, his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it stood, years afterward, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. He answered to both names. It was all the same to him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, was Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm, no cold could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him only in one respect. They often came down handsomely, and Scrooge never did. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. Even the blind men's dogs appeared to know him, and when they saw him coming on, would tug their owners into doorways and up courts, and they would wag their tails as though they say, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded path of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, was what the knowing ones called nuts to Scrooge. But once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather and the city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who, in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal, but he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and... So surely as the clerk came in with the shovel, the master predicted that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore, the clerk put on his white comforter and tried to warm himself at the candle, in which effort, not being a man of a strong imagination, he failed. Cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Bah, humbug. I do. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them for a round dozen of months presented dead against you? If I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good it may do you, much good it has ever done you.
The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, said Scrooge. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. Why did you get married? Because you fell in love? Growled Scrooge, as if that were the only one thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Scrooge and Marley, they believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the gentleman, taking up a pen. It is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons, but under the impression that they scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink, and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others, when want is keenly felt, and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? <laughs> Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make myself merry at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there and would rather die. <laughs> if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You'll want all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It is not convenient, and it is not fair. If I were to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used. Yes, sir. <laughs> And yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wage for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. The office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide at the end of a lane of boys twenty times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in the chambers, which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms, in a lowering pile of a building up a yard. The building was old enough now and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge. The other rooms being all let out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there is nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house except that it was very large. Also, that Scrooge had seen it night and morning, 
during his whole residence in that place. Also, Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. Marley's face, with a dismal light about it, like a bad lobster in dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomena, it was a knocker again. He said, Pooh, pooh, and closed the door with a bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door, walked across the hall, and up the stairs, slowly, too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went. Not carrying a button, for it's being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door and walked through his rooms to see that all was right, he had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. A small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, and a little saucepan of gruel. Scrooge had a cold in his head, upon the hob. Nobody under the bed... Nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Lumber rooms, as usual. Old fire guard, old shoes, two fish baskets, washing stand on three legs, and a poker. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers, and his nightcap and sat down before a very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, disused bell, that hung in the room, and communicated for some purpose now forgotten with a chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, inexplicable dread, that, as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanging noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight toward his door. It came on through the heavy door, and a specter passed into the room before his eyes. And upon its coming in, the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. His body was transparent so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now. Though he looked the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief bound upon its head and chin, he was still incredulous. How now? said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. What do you want with me? Budge! Marley's voice. No doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... can you sit down? I can. Do it then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair, and felt that, in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why? Do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. 
there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then. The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his horror. But how much greater was his horror then, the phantom taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors. Its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Mercy. Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men, travel far and wide, and if the spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I would. A very little more is permitted of me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and traveling all the time? You travel fast? On the wings of the wind. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, blind man! Blind man! Not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is are susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit, working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life opportunities misused. Yet, I was like this man. I was once... I once was like this man. But you are always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business! <laughs> cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean. My business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the specter going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me? My time is nearly gone. I will, but don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you shall have yet a chance of hope and escaping my fate. A chance of hope for my procuring Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me. I thank you. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that, for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. It walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. Scrooge closed the window, and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double-locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable. And, 
being from the emotion he had undergone or from his fatigues of the day or from the glimpses of the invisible world or the dull conversation of the ghost or the lateness of the hour much in need of repose he went straight to bed without undressing and fell asleep on the instant the first of the three spirits when scrooge awoke it was so dark that Looking out of the bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber, until suddenly the church clock tolled a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hands, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Are... are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No. Your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Scrooge then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted for pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm, and the thermometer a long way below freezing. That he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap and that he had had a cold upon him at the time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am, I am immortal and liable to fall. Yeah, but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart. And you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Was I apprenticed here? They went in at sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that, if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why? It's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo-ho there, Ebenezer, Dick. A living, moving picture of Scrooge's former self, a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. My old fellow apprentice, bless me, yes. There he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire. And the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright as a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. 
In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and jovial. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, Hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, <laughs> Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face in a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out on the dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple two, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, turn your partner, bow and curtsy, curts, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and, shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that spirit, said Scrooge, heated by the remark and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add them and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance. And stopped. What is the matter? Nothing in particular. Something, I think. No, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again he saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little, she said softly to Scrooge's former self. To you very little, another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your noble aspirations fall off one by one, until the master passion gain engrosses you, have I not? What then? Even if I've grown so much wiser, what then? 
I am not changed towards you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words, no. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl or choosing her? Do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. And further of being in his own bedroom, he had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The second of the three spirits. Awaking, Scrooge found himself in his bedroom. There was no doubt about that, but it and his own adjoining sitting room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as if many little mirrors had been scattered there. And such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor, to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, Barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state, upon this couch, there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape, not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in. No be better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family? Meaning, for I am very young. My elder brothers, born in these late years? I don't think I have. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than 1,800. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast, the room and its contents all vanishing instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerk's. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen Bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name. And yet, the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons. Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and, getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, <laughs> rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable park. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud although his collars nearly choked him, 
blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your precious father then? Said Mrs. Cratchit. And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha warned his late last Christmas day by half an hour. I'm here, Mother. Said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Yes, Martha, Mother. Cried the two young Cratchits. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We had a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl. And clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm lord bless ya. Bless the coming cried the two young Cratchits who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha! Hide, Martha! Hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming. Not coming, said Bob with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from the church, and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bored him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemon, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner of the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their post, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There was never such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the theme of universal admiration, eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes. It was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last, yet everyone had had enough and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates were being changed by Miss Belinda. Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in the turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall in the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A 
the supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hallo! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quatern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly, stuck into the top. Oh, what wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last, the dinner was all done, the cloth cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect. Apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts of the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. God bless us, everyone. Said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool, Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Scrooge raised his head speedily upon hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of me mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children... Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do. Poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceeding which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha, who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, told them what kind of work she had to do, and how many hours she worked at a stretch, and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good, long rest. Tomorrow being a holiday, she passed at home. Also, how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collars so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time, the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost child traveling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sparklings of the spirit's torch at parting, Scrooge had his eyes upon them, 
and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. It was a great surprise to Scrooge as the scene vanished to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that same nephew. It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things that, while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. He said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, <laughs> he believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, all kinds of good little dots about her chin that melted into one another when she laughed, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether, she was what you would have called provoking, but satisfactory, too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow. That's the truth. And not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment. And I have nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his little whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come to dine with us. And what's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges, because they had just had dinner, and, with the dessert upon the table, were clustered around the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters. For he answered that a bachelor was a wretched outcast who had no right to express an opinion on the subject. Whereat, Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one with the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea, they had some music, for they were a musical family and they knew what they were about. When they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you, especially Topper, who could growl away in the bass like a good one and never swell the large vein in his forehead or get red in the face over it. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. There was first a game of blind man's buff, though, and I no more believe Topper was really blinded than I believe he had eyes in his boots, because the way in which he went after the plump sister in the lace tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature. Knocking down the fire irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping up against the piano, smothering himself among the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, and stood there, he would have made a feint of endeavoring to seize you, which would have been an reply to an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. Here is a new game. One half hour, spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every new question put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister cried out, <gasps> Oh, I found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. It's your Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> Which it certainly was. 
admiration was the sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, is it a bear, ought to have been, yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in a breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope. By poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain men in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out. He left his blessing, and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it no more. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground toward him. The Last of the Spirits The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and misery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save for one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, on change amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointing to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. Well, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman. I have an heir. Company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to a conversation apparently so trivial, but feeling assured that it must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost's province was the future. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. A gray-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too. And she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. I'll leave it alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it. You couldn't have met in better place, then. Eh? You was made free of it long ago, yeah? 
You know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell, then? Come on, what have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, John, you'll see. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. It was the worst for the loss of a few things like these. Not a dead man, I suppose. Mrs. Dilber, whose manner was remarkable for general propitiation, said... Oh, indeed, man. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime, hmm? If he had been, he'd have had somebody look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his laugh there, <laughs> alone by himself. Yeah. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been. You may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe. And let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. Joe went down on his knee for the greater convenience of opening the bundle and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this then, eh? Bed curtains. Ah, bed curtains. Don't drop that all upon the blankets now. The old wanker's blankets. Whose else do you think? He isn't likely to take the cold without him, I dare say. <laughs> You may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it by dressing him up in it, if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The scene had changed. And now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this plundered, unknown man. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with the death. Why, this dark chamber, spirit, will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before and found the mother and children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and he set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The color hurts my eyes. The color? Ah, poor Tiny Tim. They're better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he had walked a little slower than he used these few last evenings, mother. And so have I often. I have known him walk with... I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, exclaimed another. So had all. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so, that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today, then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps. Than they were. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. 
tell me what man that was with the covered face whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be? Or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept toward it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit. Oh, no, no. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will... Honor Christmas in my heart, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hand in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration of Phantom's hood and dress. A trunk collapsed and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, and the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. What? Well, what's today, my fine fellow? Today? Oh, why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. <laughs> do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Oh, what the? No, no, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may give them direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half crown. The boy was off like a shot. <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. <laughs> Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow, and went downstairs to open the street's door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He could never have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him short off in a minute, like sticks of ceiling wax. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas past. And, walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, that three or four good-humored fellows said, Good morning, sir! A Merry Christmas to you! And Scrooge said often afterward that... All the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithest in his years. In the afternoon, he turned his steps toward his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but made a dash and did it. Is your master at home, my dear? Yes, sir. Where is he, my love? He's in the dining room, sir, with his mistress. He knows me. I'll go in here, my dear. Fred! Why, bless my soul, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in! 
It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be hard here. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did every one of them when they came. Wonderful party. Wonderful games. Wonderful unanimity. Wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had his heart set upon. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I, I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It, it's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer, and therefore... And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. <laughs> Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken as he clapped him on the back. A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I could have given you many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Looks like old Scrooge had a change of heart, just in time. Time? Oh, look at the time, look at the time. Dinner should almost be ready. After all the hustle and bustle of Christmas Eve, it's just about my favorite thing to sit down and have a dinner with my family at home. I know we can't all be together this year, but we're all together in spirit. No pun intended. Excuse me while I set the table. Hark, I think I hear some more carolers. Thank you. 
I hope you all did. Merry Christmas, everyone. Stay warm, stay happy, stay healthy. From everyone here at Mortar and Pestle, we are wishing better than the best and a happy new year. Thanks for tuning in and keep those fires burning in your hearts and your homes. Good night. Oh, ho, 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 ho. That concludes the Mortar and Pestle Christmas Spectacular and our broadcast season. We hope you enjoyed listening to Radio Classics as much as we enjoyed making it. We could never have made this season happen without the tireless efforts of our MMP crew and talent, as well as our generous benefactors and the Coe family for their love and support. We wish to extend a special thanks to all our performers who made this special a reality. In no particular order, Tonight's special featured the voice and musical talents of Cademan Ricker Wilson, Kyle Frank, Scott Fairbairn, Brian Fairbrother, Glenda Bell, Stephen Vanny, Sean Kalaki, Alexandria Jeffrey, Judith Herman, Olivia Coe, Melissa Beveridge, John Fairbrother, Molly Lubell, Scott Griffin, Megan Graham, 
Wally Desanze, Kate Corsi, Ben Graham, Courtney Lander Watson, June Westlake, and Stuart Jeffrey. And with that, we say goodbye to you all and to 2020, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This is Radio Classics in Toronto, signing off.